Thank you so much for being here. All We've had a very uh, busy and engaged morning. Um, and I thought I'd warm you up by asking you a multiple choice question. So <laughs> did the election results leave you A, surprised, B, relieved, C, vindicated? I would say A and B. Surprised and relieved. Uh, we worked hard. Uh, we thought that we had made progress. And we are happy to see that uh, the electorate agreed with us and uh, gave us an affirmation and a mandate. And I think it makes a big difference to Singapore. I would not use words like vindicated in politics. You only know if you're vindicated 100 years after things have passed. <laughs> so, Tim, um, I guess a lot of people were surprised. And I've heard a range of different uh, analysis for why the scale and scope of the swing towards your party, which include, uh, obviously, uh, a set of policies which are a little more centrist and a little more people friendly, <coughs> uh, the sympathy wave, uh, euphoria over SG50, and finally, the bogey from the bookies, who sort of had these results which are showing extremely close results between the PAP and the opposition, which brought a lot of swing vote to vote for the PAP. Have you done any analysis? What is your take on what the key factors were? I would be, we, we will study it carefully. I think it's difficult to say for sure because nobody actually anticipated uh, the, the result which we received. So any explanations are ex post, post hoc. Uh, I would say that voters approved of what we did and took the view that they wanted us to continue on the track which we were doing. And that the best way to do this is to send us a signal that they approved of what we did. That's the most straightforward way in which to develop a relationship and to build a bond and to make the system work. And the opposition had a different storyline. They said, the government is doing good, you vote for us, the government will work even harder. I think that's a very dangerous approach and it goes against human nature. I mean, if you have a friend and your friend is nice to you, you are nice to him or her. Uh, and I think most Singaporeans agreed with us that the way to build a relationship and to develop a close bond for the future was to work with the government. And the government fully intends to honour that and to work with the people and to engage them uh, in the decisions which we have to make going forward. All right, Pim. So let's hold the thought. I'm going to come back to questions about Singapore and Singapore's future uh, in a bit. Uh, but I just want to leave with this thing. I would have said it's a good thing the haze is lifted, except it's not. Uh, but I, I want to actually start um, the dialogue really from a little bit further afield, uh, which is uh, something that's on the mind of a lot of people right now, and that is China. Uh, you know, quite clearly, China's slowdown is quite palpable. Um, and uh, in recent weeks, uh, apart from the slowdown, there's been a lot of concern with some of the heavy-handed measures they've taken, particularly controlling the stock market, the telegraphing of the exchange rate change, and so on. Uh, there are two narratives out there. One narrative is um, the slowdown is a lot worse than people see, and therefore they're panicking. Uh, the second narrative, which says that the process of liberalization is a pace, and some of these measures are uh, fundamental errors of uh, uh, execution, but nothing fundamental at a policy level. So what do, you, what do you think is happening there? I think it's on the exchange rate, I think it is very difficult to adjust exchange rates downwards. Upwards even, but downwards even more so. There's no good way to do it, and whichever way you do it, the market will anticipate your intentions and front run you. So I do not envy the um, choices and the difficulties executing it. I think that we've weathered the little kerfuffle and it will move on. Uh, on the stock market, no government takes a purist approach. If you are in America, you have a Greenspan put, if you remember. If you are in China, you don't have quite the same instruments as the chairman of the Fed. Well, you try to find some other way to handle it. It may be clumsier than necessary because you don't have enough experience. It may be a bit arbitrary. It may also have been that on the way up, the government should have um, 
counsel more circumspection and taken more measures to uh, discourage the bubble from forming and the euphoria from going overboard. I think these are lessons which they will learn in time. Uh, but I would say that the Chinese stock market is not a vital part of the economy. I do not see a transmission from a stock market crash to an economic recession or depression in China because that's not the way the, 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 the structure works. The, the commanding heights of the economy are not listed on the Shanghai Stock Exchange and, uh, or, or even where they are is only in a small proportion. And so the question for the Chinese is how can they manage the structural reforms which will enable the economy to grow, not at 8, 9, 10 percent anymore as it used to, but 6, 7, 7 plus percent for another decade or so. And I think what they need is to have the political preconditions so that the leadership can push on these very difficult structural issues, whether it's SOEs, whether it's taxes, whether it's land, uh, particularly agricultural land, whether it's urbanization. Uh, these are things where they have big decisions to make, and I think that they will need to make progress, not necessarily um, in a military style nationwide, but with experiments and, and trials and successes and then progressive implementation. And so you see over time that we are heading in the right direction. It's sort of you know, what Deng Xiaoping said, crossing the river by feeling the stones. The question people wonder is, do they still have the relative degree of control over the overall economic system and apparatus that people used to believe? I think it's a myth that China is a monolithic system where the center can decide anything and do anything it wants. In fact, there are many different interests, there are many different groups, there are many different organizations, and there's a fair amount of free play amongst them. Uh, it may not be an American-style presidential election or a Western-style free market economy in full, but there are many different pieces and it is very hard to get them all to go together. And giving orders doesn't always work. So I mean, the, the, the Chinese have a very common, very familiar phrase, the top has got policies, the bottom has got countermeasures. And uh, as they go through the process of uh, reform, including SOE reform, etc., uh, your own sense is that the policy is trickling down into the rest of the apparatus, uh, the provinces, uh, the state-owned uh, enterprises are as effective as they used to be? Well, I think the question is how quickly you can set new directions at the top and therefore cause general movement in the right general direction nationwide. You cannot give an order and have it happen across the country because the circumstances are so different from Xinjiang to the northeast to the, uh, Guangdong or, or, or Zhejiang or Suzhou, Jiangsu where you are, uh, have a very developed economy. The conditions are very different. But they have to move and they have to have people on, in each of these areas whom they trust and who can exercise judgment on their behalf. PM, one of the things that they appear to be doing, President Xi announced uh, this whole One Belt, One Road uh, policy, which really looks like a China internationalization, not dissimilar to Japan after the Plaza Accord and so on and so forth. Now, this obviously has some positive implications for countries in our region. But I also wonder whether the socio-political implications of this uh, can be a little concerning. Now, obviously, China's uh, spreading the elbows in the last few years has been a source of concern in the South China Seas. How do <clears throat> countries in the region balance China's uh, extended economic activity, which is a force for the good, with their political and uh, other diplomatic agendas? Well, the Chinese would like to make friends around the region, develop economic relationships with them. They, they see opportunities, markets around them. They see sources of natural resources, uh, minerals, energy. And they want friends, not just for bilateral purposes, but also because they want friends uh, at the United Nations. Uh, at the same time, they would like what they consider very important interests, such as territorial or maritime claims, 
uh, to be respected and, if possible, to be affirmed. Uh, similarly, countries around them uh, would like to do business with China and take advantage of uh, the opportunities which are in China, which are abundant, even at a slower growth rate. Uh, and they would like to manage their disagreements with China, whether in the South China Sea or elsewhere, in such a way that it doesn't poison the overall relationship. So when it comes to one belt, one road, the Chinese want to... It's a slogan, but it's a slogan with a, con, with a, a guiding thought, which is that they would like to develop ties with into Central Asia, the countries there, the stands, and into Southeast Asia and Southeast Asia, and South Asia along the maritime and along the ocean routes, and secure their sea lines of communications and their friends in the region. Uh, from ASEAN's point of view, you might ask how we fit into them. We might also ask how does that give opportunities to ASEAN's own plans? How would we? use that to help ASEAN come closer together, to have our own connectivity uh, schemes uh, advance, to have our own infrastructure built, and to have our countries prospered. And I think there will be opportunities, because the Chinese are putting substance behind their slogans. Uh, they've got a uh, One Belt, One Road fund, I think $40, $50 billion, which uh, they will do, make investments. Uh, they've got the AIIB, which is a very bold project, still early stages, but uh, it's very widely welcome, and we see that as, I see that as a force for the good. It's a way in which China wants to exercise its influence, which is, in, which is uh, constructive and which will be welcomed by many countries and will help to contribute to the integration and the prosperity of the region. China, Japan, you think the heat is uh, being dissipated somewhat, or? I think the temperature has come down some, but I don't think the fundamental difference in um, perspectives has gone away. Because uh, after the war, there was no reconciliation as there was between France and Germany. And it's very difficult to do that now, one generation, well, three, two and a half generations later. So the, the competing narratives, the competing perspectives on what happened in the world, in, in the Sino-Japanese War and in the Second World War. Uh, that is one major historical factor which continues to cast a shadow today. Uh, but it's also the question of how China as a growing power can fit Japan into its schemes and how Japan as a considerable economy, still more, much more advanced than China, can hold its own without souring its relations with its growing and, and, and um, um, very steadily developing neighbor. So space to be watched. By the way, I just want to remind the audience, please feel free to send in your questions. I will track them on the iPad as we go along. Uh, PM, I want to come closer to home, which is the <coughs> region. You know, I, I sometimes um, reflect that I've been in the region personally like 20, 30 years. The socio-political situation in Southeast Asia today is a little less certain than it has been in a long time. So Thailand, Malaysia with the scandal and you know, some of the more uh, various rallies which seem to have some racial overtones. Um, Indonesia, the politics is a little um, uh, strange in terms of executive decision-making ability and so on. Uh, do you see a concern? Uh, where do you see the future of the region going? Well, the region is never without issues. Every country has its own uh, uh, domestic preoccupations, always does, even the most open one. Even in Singapore, we have to make sure that our home is well taken care of and we are not just outward looking, while we remain open for business with the world. But if you look around the region now, just the countries which you take in Thailand, I think there's the, really, the, the question looming over it is the succession and what that means for um, the, the Thai government and politics. And that's something which uh, the Thais are very focused on. In Malaysia, there are uh, political uncertainties. And in Malaysia, race is a very big factor in politics, always has been. It's fundamental to the system in Malaysia. And so it's 
concerning but not surprising to see that when you have uh, uh, political uncertainties and um, uh, uh, issues not easily resolved, that it translates into a racial dimension. Apart from um, underlying trends of religion and race, uh, which have been there for some time. Uh, in Indonesia, it's a new government which took office last year with President Jokowi. I think there's a nationalist mood in the country, uh, which the government will have to reflect. And uh, it's something which, you know, if it's channeled in the right direction, can lead to pride and a drive to take the country forward. But on the other hand, has to be managed carefully so that it doesn't become something which is xenophobic, which is protectionist, which becomes assertive and then causes friction with others, which leads to a minus for the country itself. It has to be watched. So I guess the question is, there's always been a lot of optimism about ASEAN as a bloc, maybe a single asset class. And the ASEAN economic community, you know, end of this year, uh, has a lot of plans in place and so on. Uh, so I'm going to ask this question carefully, because if I ask you how you feel about it, you have to say you're optimistic. But I'm going to ask you, um, what do you think needs to be done to make the ASEAN economic community even better than the current uh, prognosis? Well, we'll have to keep on working beyond the 31st of December. We set the target for the ASEAN economic community 2015, and we had a choice of putting it the 1st of January or the 31st of December. <laughs> we decided on the 31st of December to give ourselves a bit more breathing space. And well, we are getting there, and I think we'll have quite a lot of things done by then. But by no means everything which we aim to do, and even if we had done everything which we aim to do, we would have to set new agenda to go beyond that. And we've got a, an eminent persons group to think about what should be the new agenda beyond that. But I think the key thing for ASEAN is that the countries should be able to devote political attention and capital towards regional cooperation away from their domestic agendas. If your priority is dom domestic agendas have to be attended to, but if that becomes all-consuming and you do not have space for ASEAN cooperation or you are unable to make the case for ASEAN cooperation. For example, in uh, investment guarantees, for example, in trade, for example, in technical cooperation or human resources, then, uh, well, we'll have the form of it, but we will not have fully fulfilled the substance. So, PM, the que one question is, I mean, obviously, people are very wary of a Brussels kind of arrangement. In fact, in ASEAN, it's probably not viable. But is there a case to be made for a stronger secretariat or a stronger central coordinated agency as opposed to the ASEAN way? You can have any amount of capable staff in the secretariat. If sovereign powers do not agree to work together, the secretariat can do nothing. I mean, you look at the United Nations. They, are, they have moral influence, they have standing, but they have to deal with sovereign powers and particularly the P5 in the United Nations. And if the powers do not agree, the Secretary General is powerless. And in ASEAN, this is not a political union, not even a partial political uh, confederation. This is an alliance or a, 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 an agreement involving sovereign powers. And unless all the powers agree, you cannot move. There is no provision of majority voting amongst ASEAN countries. So, so, I guess a good segue. Let me then talk about the partial political federation, which is Europe. Yes. Um, you know, Europe has interestingly been off the radar in the last year, ever since Greece sort of simmered down, uh, till this whole migration issue uh, blew up. Um, but I guess there are two questions here. One is the structural reforms in Europe uh, a lot of people wonder whether this will happen. There's a bounce in Europe, but some of it seems to be Europe's QE version through Mario Draghi. Uh, but the more profound question is the viability of the Euro or the EU project itself, and what do this, does this migration crisis tell us about how they really feel about being one land? 
Well, it tells us that the political identities have not really merged, and David Cameron was not alone in saying, I don't want to take any more. I mean, ideally, when, when David Cameron says no free movement and wanted to renegotiate the accession to the EU, uh, the, the received wisdom was that he was offside, and this is a fundamental value, and uh, it's not in the Europeans cannot agree to it because it goes to the core of what the European project is. But when you have maybe a million illegals arriving every year and they can arrive in Malta or, or Cyprus and therefore have free access to the whole of Europe and Scandinavia and Germany and France, well then we see whether our theories can actually happen in political reality. And it's quite clear that it cannot happen in political reality. It's just not wearable. And it's not just Hungary, which is a hard line. Even Germany has decided that, you know, beyond a point, it's completely unacceptable to the population. So there are limits. The question is how you can shepherd this forward, accepting those limits, but gradually bringing the countries closer together. We think uh, the European project will continue to exist. Or is there a possibility of at least the euro unraveling? I think it is most undesirable to speculate about such possibilities. <laughs> Spoken like a politician. <laughs> it's, it, is, it is always possible, but the cost is horrendous. And you may not intend it, but if you handle Greece not quite right, or if between, in this game of chicken between uh, the creditors and the debtors, uh, you misjudge and the outcome is unexpected, well, you could have something you didn't, didn't want to do. Brexit, Prime Minister? Brexit? Well, David Cameron has taken a bet, and I hope that he's bet in the right direction. I think for Britain also, um, you can leave the euro, but if you think that you want to have a future, your future really is part of a wider region. And, uh, the idea of a special relationship with America as an alternative to the European link, I think that may have been plausible in the 60s and 70s, but today the Americans find Britain useful because Britain gives them a link into Europe, and if Britain is not in, not, doesn't count in the councils of Europe, then what is the value? Because you're not talking about major forces, um, I mean, the British Navy is smaller than it has been for a very long time. And the willingness of the British people to go and be soldiers and shed blood, whether Afghanistan or Iraq, I think is less than before. So, when comes your influence? It has to be from being part of a wider region in which you have some stake. It's like Singapore. I mean, why do we give weight and importance to ASEAN, because we know that as a small country, however successful, uh, your voice is limited. Within ASEAN, you have half a billion people. Well, it's a significant group. We can speak with the group, sometimes for the group. I think we are better able to advance our interests. Okay, PM. So, moving even further west to the US, which is uh, uh, in a state of perpetual election politics. Uh, what's your sense between, I'm not sure if you've seen any of the Republican debates and especially... I haven't Mr. had Trump. time to watch them, but I've seen some reports about them. So uh, do you have a they, view? they seem like reality shows. <laughs> no, it, it's a, it's a theatre. And it's a theatre which is a mechanism by which you try and winnow down a dozen Republican candidates to one or two hopefully ex ele plausible and electable ones. And if they happen to be competent and wise, so much the better. <laughs> and if they don't, then you take them anyway. Well, that's the mechanism. Uh, what's your sense of the electoral mood in the U.S.? And particularly, you know, with shale gas and the, uh, the reduction in energy dependency on the Middle East and so on, is there a bias in the U.S. to be more isolationist and inward-looking? I don't know that shale gas is the issue. Certainly in terms of Middle Eastern politics, it makes their uh, anxieties less fraught. But really, there's one, that anybody in the oil business will tell you, there's one global energy market. And you may or may not be directly buying from the Iranians or the Syrians or the 
or, or, or the Iraqis or, or the Saudis, but if there is a disruption in the Middle East and the world price goes from $50 to $100 per barrel, your price is going to go to $100 per barrel unless you do some very drastic and uh, uh, unpalatable things to your economy. So I don't think that the shale gas itself is making America isolationist. I think what is worrying is that the uncertainties of globalization, the anxieties over jobs, over competition, uh, over out offshoring, are making the case for world trade, for free trade, for free trade agreements, for openness, for an international outlook more difficult. And the, the burden which the Americans have borne, the blood which they have shed in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, have, made it, have made them weary of taking on more obligations. And the American president has to take this into account. And it shows on, in Congress. So even for the TPP, it's, which is really should be a no-brainer, a trans-Pacific partnership, it was very difficult to reach the point even to get a TPA, a Trade Promotion Authority. In other words, what used to be called fast track. Never mind the deal itself. And the deal itself has been very difficult to negotiate because of these political constraints in America. So that is worrying, but America is resilient and we hope that as its economy, when its economy recovers, the mood will shift. I have a question here, PM, also on the US. Uh, how would you critique the way in which the US government has managed its relationship with China? And what advice would you give Obama for the upcoming dialogue? I, but a lot of them took advice from your father at one time. So. <laughs> well, my father was a different person. <laughs> I, I think the American relationship with China has generally been stable. I think both sides do not want it to go sour. I'm not sure that there's a deep degree of trust between the two sides. I think the Chinese believe that the Americans would like to hem them in and circumscribe their influence. The Americans believe that the Chinese want to uh, supplant, it's too strong a word, but diminish American influence in the region and become the dominant regional power. And you've got to work through this in order to cooperate with each other, and yet cooperate with each other in a way that smaller countries, Japan not so small, Korea not so small, Southeast Asian countries mostly small, I do not feel that they have been edged out and there's a condominium of the big powers. So I think the emphasis has been there. Um, the, the, there's uh, some effort being put into developing personal understanding and rapport with the leaders, which, with Xi Jinping certainly. Obama has had um, a previous retreat with him in I think Sunnyvale in California and they've tried to talk uh, but you've got to in institutionalize this, and it's not just the, the top leader, but also the, offic the officials and the militaries. And that is a very challenging job, because you're talking about a very major change in the uh, balance of power in the landscape internationally, with China becoming um, a much more prominent and influential. And America has to be able to accommodate that without just saying, well, you do what you like. I'm, I'm in sunset because America is not in sunset. Good. All right, PM. So, uh, as I promised, I want to bring the discussion back to Singapore. And I noticed most of the questions I have here are um, around the big question of where does Singapore go from here. Uh, there's obviously uh, one question which says, the recent election results, they obviously seem to validate the policy stance and policy shift that happened over the last four or five years. A DPM Thurman would say over the last 10 years, which is a more people-friendly uh, government. Would you say the policies have hit the sweet spot, or do you think they need more tweaking, more left, more right? I don't think that is a one-dimensional thing. I think you have to have policies continually being adjusted, and it's not just a matter of more welfare or less but also how can we have policies and measures which will actually address specific anxieties and needs of the people. It could be housing, it could be jobs, it could be opportunities. I think these are things which we can work on. The most difficult set of policies to develop 
will be the set of which will be the set which will have to meet aspirations and expectations. Because there, as you meet expectations, new expectations arise, and then you have to decide, you have, you have to manage those while trying your best to meet them. And uh, that is, uh, is not quite pursuing a tail, but it's chasing a rainbow. And uh, however far you go, the rainbow is still in front of you. You never get there. I have a question here from um, Anand Mahindra, from the chairman of the Mahindra Group. So Singapore has demonstrated a great capacity to reinvent its economic positioning and strategy in response to changing global dynamics. Does the slowing growth in China and the consequential erosion in Singapore's exports require another bout of reinvention, or is it just a matter of Singapore having to reconcile itself to lower growth going forward? I think when you are no longer a teenager, you are no longer as bouncy as before. But if you stop growing, either in terms of your, of your perspective or in terms of your capabilities, then you, you, you will decline. Um, I think we have, to re we have to think how we can continue to keep the economy powered and energized at a time when 2 to 3 percent growth, or if you can get a little bit more than that, will be a good performance. How do I get that? How do I sustain that over the next 10 or 15 years? And that is a challenge. Um, it's not just because of China, it's really because we have gone into a phase shift because the old formulas can no longer work when you're at full employment and you just can't bring in uh, unlimited numbers of foreign workers or professionals. You've got to do it by upgrading, by productivity, by transformation. Now, which, which areas can we go into? How can we develop those quite general capabilities amongst our people so that you are able to take the jobs and you also have that resilience, you are prepared to change jobs and to adapt. I think every few years we've had uh, an economic review. I did one, probably the first one back in 30 years ago in 1985. And since then we've done one every five, 10 years. And it may be time for us to take a look again. So PM, you uh, addressed two things which I want to uh, hone in on. One, it's a hairy chestnut. So this thing about how much foreign talent and how much this thing we can continue to bring into a city-state like Singapore, obviously the U.S. success story is in part being predicated on an open immigration policy. But we have challenges given the small size and land constraints and infrastructure constraints. How do you get the balance right? There's a concern that the traces of increased xenophobia in Singapore, does that worry us? I think we have to watch the attitudes in Singapore. I would say generally, attitudes are still quite open. Online, of course, you have very extreme views which are not helpful at all. Uh, in practice, we have been open, in fact, more open than the United States. The United, and, uh, and for a small city state, that is a very difficult stance to sustain. The United States is open, but you know that immigration is a very charged political issue, and illegal immigrants particularly is. Uh, there is no solution because you cannot come to a consensus between the uh, parties in Congress. In Singapore, we have to manage it so it doesn't reach that position. And it's not just a matter of whether people will like it or don't like it. It's what is it which can help to strengthen our society and not dilute us so that suddenly you find that Singapore has changed. We have to adapt, we have to, to evolve, we have to absorb uh, ideas, experiences, um, talent from many parts of the world. But at the same time, there's a sp some essence and spirit of Singapore which is valuable, and you don't want to wake up tomorrow and find that that's gone. And that's where we are. As long as our own s population is stable, I think we can manage that. The difficulty comes when your own population is declining, like it is in Germany or in Japan, then, numerically, you can top up with foreign numbers. But in terms of the essence of it, you become more and more strange as you go along. So make more babies is the slogan. Well, that's a bit of an oversimplification. <laughs> have more happy families. All right, have more happy families. The other thing, um, uh, if you go back to the Singapore strategy from the mid-60s, which, you know, just to simplify, is to create a first world infrastructure and a third world region. What is the strategy for the next 10, 20 years? The smart nation, the innovation agenda, where do you see us going? Uh, we must assume and hope that our neighbours will be making progress towards first world standards. 
If they don't, then we are always in a neighborhood where it's, uh, well, there are opportunities, but it will be a drag on us. And if they do, what is it which we are able to add, which they are not able to do? And if you look at cities in America or cities in Europe, even in Japan. It's a first world environment, and yet certain cities have something different which other cities don't. You go to Boston, you get uh, the whole education and science and technology cluster. You go to Los Angeles, you got the film, arts. You go to San Francisco, you got Silicon Valley. You go to London, you got financials, you got finances. There are lots of cities in Europe, in fact, other financial centers too, but London is special. And so we need to be in that kind of a position, our, our environment prospering, but Singapore able to be something different from them. Smart cities is part of it, but smart cities is just the technology and the enabler. But what it really means is that constellation of talent, that ability to organize and to, to enable the human spirit to be fully expressed. And people to come here, dream great dreams, and do great things. I have a question from uh, uh, Maurizio Tamagnini, Tamagnini from Italy. PM, what are the three words that you would want to choose to describe a successful Singapore 50 years from now? Resilient, survivable, and unique and proud of itself. Because you have to be resilient. Because you must expect that the next 50 years and more will have lots of ups and downs. And if you are unable to take it psychologically and every time things come down, you, you give up hope, then you're finished. You have to be survivable because when things do go down, we have to have those resources to see us through and to be able to reinvent ourselves and to protect our interests in a world where you're going to have climate change, you're going to have uh, uh, security uh, challenges like terrorism, we are going to have very major um, shifts in the strategic landscape. And if we are unable to hold our own there, whether through diplomacy or armed forces or just the uh, resources and the people, then we won't be there. Thirdly, you have to be unique and proud of yourself. Because if we are not special, and there could be any, un, any number of other cities in the region or in the world where Singaporeans will be completely comfortable, then what is it which holds them in Singapore and makes them want to keep Singapore going? It has to be something different, and we have to be proud of that. And then we can make it work, and our children, we hope, they will feel, yes, I've I've grown up in a place which I truly appreciate, and one day I will make it work too. And then we'll be all right. This is home truly. Huh? The, 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 you know, there's always been this uh, view, this paranoia and the leadership in Singapore that you know, survivability is a question mark. Yes. Do you still feel that? I think only the paranoid survive. <laughs> 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 I, I think we have to worry about it. Uh, we don't think that we will, have a, we will uh, vanish from the face of the earth tomorrow, but on the other hand, we remember the frogs which don't notice temperatures going up and gradually get boiled swimming around in warm water. So I think that we do have to remember that we are more prosperous, yes, we are more secure, yes, but we are still a little red dot in a very exciting part of the world and things can happen to us. The, you, you talked about you know, our future generations and kids. At a broader level, PM, does this whole issue about where are the future jobs going to come from exercise you? I mean, with technology, artificial intelligence, robotics, the nature of work is changing fundamentally. What does it mean to people's livelihoods, the way people live, including perhaps redistributive agendas as there's more concentration of economic resources? Uh, it is something to be concerned about. If you take the conventional optimistic view, every time there has been technological progress, people have adapted and they have new jobs have been created and people have learned to do their new jobs and they have prospered and everybody has benefited from it. So today's laborer is much, much, much better than the laborer 
in the 18th or the 19th centuries, before the spinning mill was invented, before industrialization. Is it true of the next stage with robots, with artificial intelligence, with automating not the physical labor, but the intellectual labor, when you can diagnose illnesses better than a specialist, when you can read an X-ray more reliably than a radiographer? Can I train the radiographer to be the designer of that X-ray machine? Some can, some not. In which case, what do we do? So I think that it is not a trivial problem. Our people are getting educated better. So we are doing our best to be able to stay ahead of the rising tide. But at the same time, in any society, even when you automate all these jobs, you will still have that need for a quota of routine jobs which cannot be automated. And which I think at that point, our well-educated people will not want to do. So how do you cope with that? The Koreans have this problem in bags. They've got about 80% of their people graduates. But they are not able to find 80% of jobs which are graduate-type jobs. So there is a considerable amount of unhappiness and angst, not because they haven't had the jobs, or they, uh, the, don't have jobs or don't have uh, education, but they don't feel that the opportunities are there and the aspirations are not met. So we are going to want to educate our people, and I think more and more of our people will want to be and will be able to be able to reach that level. But how do we have those jobs to, and that structure of the economy where they can fit in? And the answer for a small city has to be, well, we can do that if we see our footprint not just as Singapore, but Singapore and beyond. And so you can be operating overseas, you can have companies which have uh, a network overseas and the thinking part is here and the doing part may be elsewhere. And then I have a balance not taken within Singapore but taken within a broader penumbra. Uh, but these are challenges which we have to deal with the next phase. I think it's far better to deal with this kind of problem than it is not to invent um, new technology and new artificial intelligence and be uh, frozen in this where we are now for the next 50 years. I was once in Cuba on a study visit. This was in the 1970s. And one of the officials came to brief us and explain how they created jobs in Cuba and then put people into different places. And he said, if one day somebody invents a machine which will eliminate all those jobs, we'll take the machine and throw it into the deep blue sea. Well, <laughs> he was only half facetious. But that kind of an approach hasn't led the country anywhere. And now Cuba is looking for such machines and upgrading and trying to modernize its economy. And I think that we have to take that approach that technology will change, the future will be more challenging, but also will open up many, many opportunities for us. And let's get ready to seize them. PM, I notice uh, the clock shows I'm running out of time. I want to try and wind up on a couple of uh, more personal questions. One. Uh, from the audience. Uh, while your father retired many years ago, his passing this past year must have been a big blow to you. How has this passing changed how you run the country? Well, my father stepped down as Prime Minister in 1990, so it's 25 years ago, and uh, I'm not his successor, but his successor's successor. But he had a long shadow. He had a long shadow, and he gave us sage advice, even into old age, but he, he prepared very well for his gradual fading away. So the, the greatest, one great tribute to him was that on the day he died, the stock market didn't move. I mean, people had confidence. They knew that Singapore would carry on uh, in a different way because we are not him and this vo uh, my voters are not his voters, but uh, we have been able to work this system. So the last question, PM, it's some, something that's puzzled me. So we have a fairly firm retirement age for the army, and I can see the reason for that. Right? You want your general to lead the forces and so on. Uh, why do we have a similar view on politics? In most countries in the world, a leader of your age is just getting into politics. So people lead the country <laughs> into the 80s. So why this hurry to retire? 
In most countries in the world, a leader who's been 10 years in government is already in retirement. <laughs> so, so, I think because you want this system to continue, a system where the leaders are well prepared, where the transition takes place seamlessly, and where we are able to have not only the individuals, but the whole society and everybody watching us looking forward and assured that Singapore is well taken care of, not just for the next five years, but the next 10, 15 years. And the only way to do that is to be very, very, con very, very active and aggressive in pushing for succession. Because if we don't do that, it's very comfortable. I, I know my ministers, in fact, I've known them 40 plus years, some of them. And we have complete confidence in one another. We can work together. We can keep this show going for another five years. Yes, surely. After that, we'll be a bit grayer. The next election poster will show me with a bit less hair. And I still can run it if I'm in good health. But every year, you are a bit less energetic, every year a bit less in touch with the new generation. And every year people will ask a bit more insistently, what happens after this? And we do not want to be in that position for Singapore. And that means you have to plan for succession very consciously, deliberately, and push it aggressively. And in Mr. Lee's term, time, he had colleagues who didn't agree with this perspective. And they said, well, we are still not old. Why are you doing this? But between me and my colleagues, I think we all know that we are not old, but we are not getting younger. And therefore, we have to push it aggressively. And that's what I'm intending to do when I announce my new cabinet. PM, I've just been told we can go on a few more minutes. So I have a bunch of questions here, but let me take pause and see, does somebody want to uh, use a mic and ask a question instead? Around the room, no? All right, so I have a whole bunch of questions here. Um, so there's one from Ed Cleese West. I'm going to go back to Singapore, PM. So are you concerned that the future growth in Singapore may widen income disparities and be less inclusive? Uh, in fact, there was another question which had the same thing. So how do you continue to grow in a kinder, more uh, people-oriented way? It could happen. It's a trend in many countries. Uh, it's happened less in Singapore than in many developed countries because if you look at America or uh, Europe, uh, in many cases at the lower end, incomes haven't gone up at all. In fact, in America, even the median income hasn't gone up very much for a very long time. But in Singapore, incomes have gone up across the board, even at the low end. Um, the distribution has widened if you take a 15-year perspective. But if you look at the last two, three, four years, it's been stable, in fact, some improvement. So whether we can keep it stable depends on how well we are able to upgrade the lower end of the income earners. Upgrade through education, upgrade, upgrade through skills future, while at work, giving, giving people opportunities to take modules, to attend courses, to be exposed to new responsibilities, to be tried out, and to continue to move up and to have that kind of society where you can move up and rise from the bottom to the top and people don't hold it against you that you don't quite know how to dress the right way or don't have quite the right pucker accent. And I think we have to work at that. Uh, just sticking to this income thing, there's another question here which is sort of related. Singapore has a compensation policy for its government leaders which allows it to attract the best and reduce the risk of corruption through bribery. And political and government leadership has been crucial to Singapore's success. Uh, well, this says, can other ASEAN countries pursue a similar policy and reduce graft? Let me, uh, maybe that, but also, you know, there was obviously a lot of discontent about that some years ago. We had to go and tweak back the compensation structure in the government and so on. Uh, in hindsight, is that, this obviously, does that prove effective? And how do you balance that need for a clean and non-corrupt government with obviously the expectations of the population at large. Well, we have, to ex we have to explain what we are doing. At the same time, we have to justify uh, the scheme we have worked out. And we also must demonstrate that we are worth what 
we're, we're actually doing our job and well worth whatever the cost is of running the government. And I think that is a continuing work in progress. There's no solution to that which is permanent. There's no country which does not have that issue. Um, in, people have found different solutions. Sometimes you work on the basis of a revolving door. You, you work for a token fee, you go out and you get a $5 million book advance. Sometimes you have allowances, you provide travel, you provide um, expenses. Uh, in the case of the British, they had a scheme for the House of Commons which was designed to top up their salary, but it, what seemed to be a presentable way, which is that you can claim expenses. And then people started claiming expenses for watching videos which are doubtful and for, <laughs> and for cleaning up the moat on their castle. And it became an issue, so now they've cut that back. And I don't think it has made that problem easier because now you, your, your members of parliament are paid even less. So we decided that there's no easy solution, better to be direct and open, and let's make this a clean wage. And, unfortunately, and that means no medical benefits, no retirement perks, no travel perks, no entourage of staff, no uh, housing and uh, mansions. It's one bundle, one, one sum, and everything is on your account. And I think that is a more honest way to do it. Uh, again, there's a question here from Peter Turku, which sort of suggests that there's a, a European approach, which maybe you can argue a little bit different. There's a lot of uh, negativity often about Europe, especially in Asia. Uh, why do you think some European populations are the happiest in the world? In countries like France and Holland, they even make babies at population sustainable levels. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't pay their officials all that much. Well, if they were the happiest in the world, you wouldn't have Le Pen on the right and you wouldn't have uh, Podemos on the left, one in France, one in Spain, and you wouldn't have all the angst you now have about the, the uh, uncertainties of the country, which is really not growing as fast as it should. And where do the children go? The children go to other countries. That's so I would be hesitant about anybody who says the grass is greener somewhere else. Uh, PM, you've been uh, most kind, not only with your time, but with the uh, candid responses on a very broad and far-ranging uh, range of subjects. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and I have to say that uh, I am in the camp that says wisdom, which comes with age, is not a bad thing for a country. So you should think about your succession planning. <laughs> but will you all join me in giving the Prime Minister a big round of applause? Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Pierre.